Today we are discussing optics and relativity. To get started, let's draw a coordinate system. Here are x and y coordinates, and we would have z coming out of the, the screen. And imagine that the xz plane, the y is equal to zero plane, is the surface of the Earth. And you take a mass, and you drop it. What happens? It accelerates towards the ground with acceleration g, the acceleration due to gravity. Now imagine that you have a moving vehicle. And it is moving to the right with velocity v. And fixed on it is a coordinate system. We'll use Greek letters, psi and eta, and then coming out of the board, zeta. And inside that vehicle, you take a mass, m, and you drop it. What happens? It accelerates downward, directly downward, with respect to the moving vehicle, with an acceleration, g. In other words, the results of the experiment are the same whether you do it out at rest on the Earth or inside a vehicle that's moving with a constant velocity. And this was first, this idea formalized by Galileo, and we're going to call it the Galilean principle of relativity. And that is that no mechanical experiment can distinguish oops inertial frames of reference and a frame of reference is just a coordinate system and an inertial frame is one in which Newton's law of motion, F is equal to ma, holds. So if there's no force on an object, it does not accelerate, remains at rest, or moves in a straight line with constant velocity. So if two inertial frames are moving as relative to each other, as in the case shown here, the Galilean principle of relativity says there's no mechanical experiment you can do that can distinguish these from one another and establish, well, this one here is actually at rest and this one is moving. You could just as well assume this one is at rest and the Earth is moving. And the relation between these coordinate systems is given by what we'll call a Galilean um, transformation. So the um, x on the Earth is going to be equal to the psi on the, let's call it a train, um, plus the movement of the train, plus vt. And y will be the same as eta, and z will be the same as zeta. So there's only a relationship that's not trivial uh, if there's motion in the direction of that particular coordinate. And turning things around, psi would be x minus vt, and then these other two relations would obviously still hold. And we'll assume that if people on the Earth measure time with a clock that ticks off in t, or the time coordinate, inside the moving vehicle, they have one that ticks off uh, tau as the unit of time, well, t and tau are the same. So tau is equal to t. There's a universal time uh, everywhere. 
in all systems. So if you look at, say, the time derivative of position x, y, and z, um, and we use the dot notation so that x dot represents the time derivative of x when y dot and z dot. Okay, that's just the velocity. Let's do the same thing in the Greek coordinates. What's that going to be? I'm realizing that tau is the same as t. Um, well, psi is x minus vt, so that time derivative is just going to be x dot minus v and then you'll have y dot and z dot because of these relations so positions certainly aren't the same velocities are not the same the velocity in the x direction differs in the two systems by plus or minus v the motion of the moving frame but if we then look at acceleration which is going to be the derivative of velocity what are we going to get well, let's, let's do it with this. It's going to be x double dot because v is a constant. And then you're going to have y double dot and z double dot. And of course, that's the same thing you would get if you did this in the x, y, z coordinate system. You get x double dot, y double dot, z double dot. In other words, the acceleration is the same in both frames of reference. Now, if the two frames were accelerating with respect to each other, that would no longer be true. So inertial rest reference frames are one, ones in which um, Newton's law of motion holds, and they are characterized by the fact that they all move with respect to each other with a constant velocity. And so from this, we can conclude that there is no preferred inertial frame right which we might call absolute space we can use any frame as long as it's inertial now in the 19th century people started to realize that light is a wave and of course with the development of maxwell's equations we had a theoretical basis for saying that light is an electromagnetic wave so given that light is a wave we ask this question well let's think about sound waves or water waves in a sound wave something is waving and that is the air molecules the or if you think of it in a continuous limit, the uh, elastic gas that forms the air. In a, a water wave, it's water that's waving. So in general, with a wave, we assume something is waving. And so the question is, for light, what is waving? Now, since people only knew about um, mechanical elastic types of waves, People initially assumed that light must be the oscillation or the waving of some medium. And they called this the, do better there, luminiferous ether. And we'll just call it the ether for short. So nobody had any direct uh, you know, evidence for this. But they assumed that light must be an oscillation of this mechanical medium called the luminiferous ether. And now, here is a key point. A waving medium defines a preferred frame of reference, namely the one that's at rest with respect to the medium. So imagine that you go down to a body of water and it's nice and flat and smooth and you throw a rock in to some point you define to be the origin and the x and y coordinates are at rest with respect to you. You throw in a rock and you wait. 
what happens. Well, it creates a wave that propagates out in a circle from the point of impact of the rock. Ripples go out. And you wait a little more, and what happens? Well, now it goes a little farther. So this is say at time zero, and T1, and T2. And if we say that the speed of the wave is C, then in this case, this X coordinate here would be X is equal to C T2. And this one over here on the other side, that would be the negative of that. X is equal to minus C T2. Now, imagine you go to another body of water and it looks nice and smooth and you again throw a rock into a point that you define to be the origin and you wait and what do you see and you see something that looks like this you see that the wave spreads out into a circle but the circle is no longer centered on the point of impact of the rock and then you wait a little longer and you see something like this it expands into a larger circle um, but Again, it's no longer centered on the point of impact. And in fact, all of these circles um, have different centers. The center is moving to the right. With a velocity V. And we conclude that the medium, the water in this case, must be moving to the right with a velocity V. And we would expect that as this wave spreads out, it also translates to the right, and that's where we see this effect. So this is when the medium is at rest with respect to you, and this is when the medium is moving, in this case, to the right. So here, this point will be x is equal to well, you have two effects. You have the speed of the wave, and then you have the speed of the medium. So it'll be x is equal to c plus vt. In other words, the wave appears to you on the shore to move at a speed c plus v, speed of the water plus the speed of the wave. And then over here, you'd have x is equal to minus. Well, going to the left, the wave would appear to move slower. It would be c minus v. And let's use T2 as the, uh, the time there. Again, this would be 0, T1, and T2. And by the way, over here, going up upwards, this would be Y is equal to C, T2. And the same thing over here. This would be Y equals C, T2. No change in the, in the velocity perpendicular to the direction of the water's motion, but in the direction of the water's motion, the velocity goes up in the direction of the motion and down in the opposite direction. So this would seem to then allow you to define a preferred reference frame. And people assume since light obviously travels throughout the universe, even in the emptiness of space, therefore, if we could do this kind of experiment with light, we could determine the absolute frame of reference in the universe, the frame in which this luminiferous ether is at rest. It was for this purpose that the Michelson Morley experiment 
was conducted in 1887. And for this experiment, Michelson invented his interferometer that we've been talking about in many other contexts. And in fact, he tried to do some of these uh, same types of experiments on his own, but determined that his system did not have the precision to necessarily determine the speed of the Earth with respect to the ether. And so he then modified his uh, system with Morley, and they had a system that should have been able to measure this speed. So remember, at its heart, the interferometer has a beam splitter and two mirrors in perpendicular arms of the interferometer. This is mirror M1 and this is mirror M2. Detector and source. And so light emitted from the source is broken up by the beam splitter and sent down these two different arms. Flex off the mirrors, comes back, and they're combined in the beam splitter and then fall on the detector. Now in the Michelson-Morley interferometer, these two arms had the same length and they were fixed L. So obviously if everything was at rest, let's just say this, the ether was at rest with respect to the interferometer, then the time delay between the two arms, the relative difference in the time it takes to do the round trips would be, well, you would have the outward path would be at distance L and the inward path at distance L and you're traveling at the speed of light C so it would be 2L over C for one arm minus the 2L over C for the other arm would be zero. And so you would get no interference fringes if this was just sitting there with equal length arms in an ether that's at rest. But now, what if the ether was moving, say to the right, with velocity v? Now let's look at the arm with mirror m1. Well, the velocity up and down, which would be perpendicular to this motion v, would still travel at the speed of light c, and it would cover a distance out and back of 2L, so that would be 2L over C. How about for the other arm, the one with mirror M2? Well, now traveling to the right, the wave would appear to move with the speed C plus V, and it's covering a distance L, so delta T2 would be L over C plus V. Coming back, it'd be moving to the left, it would appear to travel with a velocity c minus v covering a distance l that would be a time l over c minus v now let's factor out an l and put everything over a common denominator c plus v times c minus v and so we would get c minus v plus c plus v uh, the v's would cancel and you get 2c and so this would look like L times 2C and multiplying out the denominator you get C squared minus V squared and now let's factor out a 2L over C 2L over C we do that by pulling a 2C out of the numerator and a C squared out of the denominator so one of the factors is C cancels and what does that leave that leaves well, you're going to have then 1 over 1 minus V over C squared. Now, what is the difference of these two times? This minus that. What's well, going to be this, ex this expression here minus that. They both have a factor of 2L over C. So it'll be that times 1 over 1 minus, sorry, 
v over c squared minus one. Now there will be a time delay and you'll see interference fringes. So the idea was, if you could look at different uh, situations at say different times of the year or by moving the interferometer, rotating it around and it was on a table that could rotate, uh, you could detect this velocity by seeing this. So for example, in this case, you would have a longer time for the round trip uh, time around this arm M2 than M1. And if, then, if you then rotated things 90 degrees, now it would be longer to travel through M1 than through M2. And in between at 45 degrees, it would be equal times. So you should be able to see fringes as you rotated this system around. Now the only case you wouldn't see that was with, uh, with the ether at rest with respect to the interferometer or moving at such a small velocity that you couldn't detect this very small time difference. Now, if this is the sun, of course the Earth goes around in approximately a circular orbit, and it moves with a velocity v that you can determine by knowing the length of the orbit and the fact that it takes one year to go through that. And what you find is the v is about on the order of 30,000 meters per second. And for comparison, the speed of light is about 300 million meters per second. So the Earth is moving pretty fast, although not nearly as fast as the speed of light. Um, in fact, this ratio V over C is about 10 to the minus 4. So it's moving at 1 hundredth of 1% of the speed of light. But that's still, that's pretty fast. So, on the previous board, we had the expression 1 over 1 minus V over C squared. And if V over C squared is small, it is, it's 10 to the minus 8th. This is very well approximated by 1 plus V over C squared, just the first term of the Taylor series. And therefore, tau, the difference in the round trip time for the two arms of the interferometer, we saw was 2L over C, this minus 1. So that minus 1 gets rid of that, and that's just then V over C squared. Now, what we want, let's say, is to have V0 tau to be about equal to one half. That would mean that we would move through half a fringe uh, in going from a velocity of equal to zero to this velocity. Or equivalently, if we took our, we were moving at this velocity, and we rotated our mirror 90 degrees, we would go from plus this value to minus this value, and we would, in that case, see an entire fringe in that rotation. And let's see, um, nu zero over c, the frequency over the speed of light is one over the wavelength. And let's assume we have a wavelength of green light, 500 nanometers then we want to figure out what are the conditions under which we can observe this fringe. So here's our tau. So let's plug that in then. We're going to have, um, we want one half to be equal to nu, which is going to be c over lambda zero. And nu is equal to c over lambda zero. And then times the tau, which is 2L over c times v over c squared. Of course, these guys cancel. Uh, and you want that to be equal to half. And so if you plug in, v is 30,000 meters per second, c is the speed of light, and you solve for the l that you would need, you find that l is about equal to 12.5 meters. So what Michelson and Morley did was um, they had an optical table that was not nearly this big but they use the idea of folding. They use mirrors to fold the interferometer arms uh, by bouncing the beam back and forth 
off of several mirrors before it comes came back into the beam splitter and they were recombined. After making observations for months, no significant fringes were observed, which was a shocking result. Now, if this just occurred at one day, uh, you could argue that the Earth just happened to be at a place in its orbit where its orbital velocity plus the velocity of the Sun and the solar system, etc., were just right so that the Earth happened to be at rest with respect to the ether right at that time. And of course, you wouldn't expect to see any fringes. But they made observations over a period of months, right? So about three months later, you'd be going in a perpendicular direction. And about six months later, you'd be going in the opposite direction. So you couldn't be at rest with respect to the ether at all these times. And so the fact that they never observed fringes was rather amazing. So people concluded that this picture on which the Michelson uh, Morley experiment was based couldn't be correct. So what was the answer? Well, maybe there is no ether. Uh, in fact, if you think about an elastic wave, so in a mechanical medium, the speed of that wave is the square root of two parameters, k over rho, where k is called the bulk modulus, essentially the spring constant of the material, how stiff it is, and rho is the mass density, kilograms per cubic meter. Now, the speed of light is on the order of about a million times the speed of sound. And if you assume that this uh, relation holds for both of the media that these propagate in, you would have to conclude that the k over rho value for light, or for the ether, the medium, will be on the order of 10 to the 12th, because you have to square this, of that value for mechanical materials, where you have sound waves. So that would mean that the ether would have to be unbelievably stiff and or unbelievably um, of low mass, of low mass density, rarefied. And when you look at these numbers and some other arguments, this just becomes rather incredible. You conclude the ether idea can't hold. And so the interpretation of this, the best interpretation that solved a lot of problems was due to Einstein. And we'll state this as Einstein's principle of relativity. And it is that no mechanical or electromagnetic experiment can distinguish between inertial frames. So just adding in to Galileo's version, the fact that electromagnetic experiments also can't distinguish between inertial frames. We already knew that mechanical experiments could not. But of course, it was thought that electromagnetic experiments could distinguish by measuring the velocity of the ether relative to the Earth.
So, just thinking about one dimension, suppose this here is the x-axis of one reference frame, and this is the psi-axis of another reference frame, and this is moving to the right with velocity v. And this picture is when t is equal to tau is equal to zero. So, if we look at the Galilean transformation, just for this one coordinate dimension of space, we have that psi would be equal to x minus vt, tau is equal to t, x is equal to psi plus vt, and t is equal to tau. Now, let's, uh, let's use natural units, so-called natural units in this case. The speed of light is very important in our arguments, and so let's use units in which the speed of light is equal to 1 and is dimensionless. And we can do that by choosing to measure time in units of seconds and length also in units of seconds by which we mean the unit will be the light second the distance that light travels in one second which is about 300 million meters. So if we use the second as our unit of time and 300 million meters about, or the distance that light travels in one second, we call that one second of length, then the speed of light is one light second per second, or one. All right, so in those units then, let's go back to our Galilean transformation and look at d psi d tau. What's that going to be? Well, that's going to be d psi is equal to x minus vt, and uh, tau is equal to t, so that's dt. And so what is that? That's dx dt minus v. So we have d psi d tau is equal to dx dt minus v, and turning that around, dx dt is d psi d tau, plus v. And this is just the idea we already looked at, that just velocities in the two frames differ by plus or minus the speed at which one of the frames moves relative to the other. Now, by this argument, we should measure dx dt is equal to d psi d tau is equal to 1 for light. Because the speed of light should be the same in all frames of reference. So if I make a measurement of the speed of light and it's different in different inertial frames, I can use that to distinguish inertial frames. The laws of physics aren't the same in all the inertial frames. So let's sketch out coordinates here. Oops, I'll use a darker green. This will be time t and spatial position x. And we'll draw some contours constant position and time. Okay, so just 
graph paper. And so let's see, this would be uh, t is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. x is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, etc. Now, for the moving system, let's assume that uh, we get contours that look like this. I didn't do that very good. And so that is equal to psi is equal to zero. We see that it's moving at a velocity of one fourth. In four units of time, it moves one unit of space. And then likewise, we'd have here, there, and there. Those would be psi is equal to. 0, 1, 2, and 3. So now let's look at the speed of light dx. The t is equal to 1. So in the xt system, right, that would be this diagonal line like so. So that would be dx dt is equal to 1. Whereas in the psi tau system, now this would also, right, we're assuming that t and tau are the same. So in that system, we would then go through these points. So this would be Psi is equal to 1, tau is equal to 1, psi is equal to 2, tau is equal to 2, etc. So this would be the line d psi d tau equals 1. But that can't be because right, something that is on this line, this red line, will not be on the orange line in the other coordinate system and vice versa. In other words, these two lines have to coincide if this is going to be true in both of the coordinate systems because obviously if we have something light is moving such that it follows this orange line well in the blue coordinates in the psi tau system that will be traveling less than one in velocity right here would be about three uh, units of distance in four units of time so it'd be only about three-fourths the speed of light instead what we must have some other kind of transformation. So if um, this is our, again, our x and t coordinates, Zero, one, two, three, and four. Zero, one, two, three, and four in space. Our blue coordinate system, the psi and tau. Well, let's see. Why don't these lines fall on top of each other? It's because the blue coordinates are sloped with respect to the green coordinates or the spatial contours of constant position. And that clearly has to be the case because that's just day-to-day -day experience that when two things are moving, uh, they have different coordinates as a function of time because of the motion. The way we could get rid of this, these relative slopes though is to also put in a slope for time. In other words, to have lines of constant position be the same as we had before but now also do the same thing for time have the lines of constant time in the moving system 
be sloped. Ah, having a hard time with the lines there. Be sloped like this. So there's a symmetry between the slopes. Now in this case, here's your speed of light. It goes, goes through these, uh, goes through these diagonal points. And how about for the Xi Tau system, right? So now, right, this would be first, right, this would be Xi equals zero, one, two, and three. And this would be tau is equal to zero, one, two, and three. And notice what we have here. Here we have t is equal to four and x is equal to four. So that slope is one to one, four over four. And here we also have Xi is equal to 3 and tau is equal to 3. So the slope there would be 3 over 3 is also 1. So we would therefore get the same line for both of the systems. So we would have the Xi d tau is equal to dx dt is equal to 1. In both systems, and the lines would fall on top of each other. So both systems could measure the same speed of light. So the coordinate transformations that give us sloping for both the space and time axes would look like this. Xi is equal to x minus vt, that's just as in the Galilean transformation. But now, for time, we'd have tau would have to be symmetrically defined as tau is equal to t minus vx. So remember here that velocities in our natural units are dimensionless. They're light seconds per second, or seconds per second. And x and t are both measured, and xi and tau, in seconds. So no problem with units here. And then for x, you'd have x is equal to xi plus v tau, and t would be tau plus v psi. Uh, as differentials, d psi would be equal to dx minus v dt. d tau would be dt minus v dx. dx would be d psi plus v d tau. And dt would be d tau plus v d psi. So if we look at a velocity, d psi d tau, in the Greek coordinates, and substitute here, we get dx minus v dt over um, dt minus v dx. And dividing numerator and denominator by dt, you get dx dt minus v over 1 minus v dx dt. And so this leads to the formulas for the addition of velocities. Let's say we call this a, a speed u sub psi, this velocity in the psi coordinates. And over here, then we'd see this would be u sub x, the velocity in the x-coordinates, minus v, the velocity between the coordinate systems, over 1 minus v ux. And going the other way, dx dt, well, you can see that the change is only that the sign of the velocity changes. So this would end up giving you the psi d tau plus v. 1 over 1 plus v psi d tau, and we could say then that ux would be u psi plus v over 1 plus v u psi.
And notice that if u psi is equal to 1, this becomes 1 plus v over 1 plus v times 1. So ux is 1 plus v over 1 plus v is equal to 1. And this is the property where we get the same speed of light. So these coordinate transformations right here apparently solve our problem. We make sure that all inertial reference frames have the same speed of light, and therefore that would explain why the Michelson-Morley experiment failed to detect any motion with respect to some hypothetical ether. Because the speed of light is always the same for both arms of the interferometer. Now there's a, a little wrinkle that we've got to fix. These transformations aren't quite done yet. We write psi is equal to x minus vt, and tau is equal to t minus vx, and then we substitute in the transformations for x and t. Well, x was psi plus v tau, and then minus v, and t was tau plus v psi. And let's see here, you've got a v tau minus v tau, so these terms cancel, and these are then psi minus v times v times psi, so that would be psi times 1 minus v squared. But we should have got psi, because we started with psi and just kept substituting. We should have ended up with psi. Likewise, you can see the same thing will happen here for time. T is tau plus V psi minus V times X, which is psi plus V tau. Uh, here's a V psi minus V psi, those cancel. And then you got tau minus V squared tau, or tau times one minus V squared, you have some shrinkage in these coordinate systems. And the solution is to introduce a dilation factor gamma is equal to one over the square root of one minus V squared. And then our transformations become psi equals gamma x minus vt tau equals gamma t minus vx x equals gamma psi plus v tau and t is equal to gamma tau plus v psi. And now if you go through this same process, let's just look here at psi, it would be now gamma times, and x would be uh, gamma psi plus v tau, and then you'd have minus gamma vt, so minus v, and t is gamma times tau plus v psi. Uh, let's see, there's a gamma times gamma is gamma squared throughout, and gamma squared would just be 1 over 1 minus v squared. And then we would have here um, v tau times gamma minus v tau times gamma. Again, those would cancel. And the other terms then would be, we'd have a here a psi where we factored out this gamma, so psi minus v times v times psi, so that would be psi times 1 minus v squared, and the 1 minus v squared's cancel, and that's just equal to psi. You can do that for any of the, the coordinates. So now you have a consistent set of coordinates. You still get exactly the same ratios for the speed of light, d psi d tau is equal to dx d tau, a t is equal to 1, because these gamma factors cancel when you take those ratios. So these are the so-called
Lorentz. Transformation. Now Einstein derived them, but Lorentz had done it earlier in a slightly different context. And so these are the proper, we say, relativistic in the terms of Einstein's principle of relativity, relativistic transformations. In standard SI units, these look like psi is equal to gamma x minus vt. Um, eta is equal to y. Zeta is equal to z. The, the two coordinates that are not in the direction of motion, they just stay the same. Tau is equal to gamma t minus v x over c squared. Now you can verify now v and c would have units of velocity, and in this case the units work out, and gamma would be 1 over square root of 1 minus v over c quantity squared. So again, that's the Lorentz transformation. And let's just test out here. If V is much, much less than C, and so that V over C is about equal to zero, uh, then gamma, right, so V over C squared is very, very small. We'll say gamma is about equal to one. And then this just become Psi is equal to X minus VT. And Tau is equal to one t and now this would be v over c squared well v over c is very small v over c squared is minuscule so if, unless x is absolutely astronomically large that last term goes away and gamma is approximately equal to one so just tau is equal to t so we recover the uh, galilean transformation in the limit that the speed of motion between the systems is much less than the speed of light. So that explains why, right? So if you look at these transformations, the things that are different are the gamma factor, dilation factor, and this term here, where the time in the moving frame uh, is not the same as in the stationary frame. We make those designations arbitrarily. It would actually drift a little bit, but that drift is so tiny and that we don't observe it in our day-to-day -day life. Now, if we were talking about things moving at velocities, which were a significant fraction of the speed of light and or over great astronomical distances, now we would start to see this. Or if we measured these times with extreme precision, and in fact, uh, starting in the 1960s, uh, I believe, and up until today, where we have atomic clocks flying in satellites forming the global positioning system, we actually do observe this shift in the time coordinates. So the clocks in orbit uh, on the satellites do not run at the same rate as clocks at rest on the Earth. And this has to be, these relativistic corrections have to be taken into account in order to get the GPS system to function properly. Now let's look at energy. Now what we're going to give here is not a rigorous derivation of a famous formula, E equals mc squared, but a plausibility argument for it. So let's look at the dilation factor, gamma. This is 1 over square root of 1 minus v over c squared in standard units. And let's do a Taylor series expansion. Right, This has the form of 1 over square root of 1 minus x, where x is very small. The Taylor series expansion looks like this. 1 plus 1 half v over c squared plus 3 eighths v over c to the fourth plus and so on. Looking at this 
first term, then it depends on velocity. Notice it is, has the form 1 half v squared, and other than the c squared, but if we added in a factor of the mass of a particle, 1 half mv squared, right, would be your classical kinetic energy. So that suggests we look at gamma times m times c squared. And what would that be? Okay, so this is gamma. So multiplied by mc squared, you'd get mc squared. Plus here, you'd bring in a factor of m and cancel this c squared. So you get 1 half mv squared. There's the classical kinetic energy. And then these other terms, you get plus 3 eighths um, m cancel a c squared that'd give you v to the fourth and leave a c squared and so on so we see that uh, this thing certainly has units of energy because one f mv squared is is kinetic energy and it seems to be a constant mc squared plus these terms that depend on v and in particular when v is equal to zero if we think of this thing as representing, in a sense, total energy, well, the energy would be E equals mc squared. You can think of that as the rest energy of the particle. And then all the other terms would be the kinetic energy if the thing was in motion. And so we could write that the kinetic energy then would be equal to this minus the mc squared, which we can write as gamma minus 1 mc squared, 1 half mv squared, plus these higher order terms. And we conclude that this must represent, in relativity theory, the kinetic energy. So for very small velocities, it agrees with the kinetic energy of Newtonian physics, but at higher speeds, you get these correction terms. And since as V goes to C, this becomes in the denominator, one minus one is zero, one over that is infinity, gamma goes to infinity as the velocity approaches the speed of light, you see that the kinetic energy would go to infinity as the velocity of the particle approaches the speed of light. So we must have, therefore, that V is always less than the speed of light for any particle. Otherwise, it would have infinite amount of energy. So the speed of light becomes an upper limit for the velocity of any particle. And going back to this rest energy idea, this implies that if there's a change in energy of the system of delta E, then that divided by the speed of light squared must be equal to a change in the mass of the system. Now, c squared is a huge number, so this is very difficult to observe, but you, it can be observed in um, nuclear reactions where there is a release of energy in a nuclear reaction, and then you measure the masses of the constituents before and after, and you find that indeed the mass has changed by this amount, delta E over c squared. Now, again, this was not a rigorous derivation of these formulas, but uh, it does give a, a plausibility argument, and indeed, they can be derived more rigorously. Now, consider the following. these three boxes here and of coordinate system x and y fixed on the box and suppose this first box is floating in empty space and inside the box you've got a mass m1 at rest and you let go of it and you have a second mass 
M2 and you launch it along the X direction with a velocity V. What happens? Well, we'll come back to that. Now suppose over here this box is resting on the ground. It's being drawn down toward the Earth with an acceleration g, and you do the same experiment. Mass m1 released from rest. Mass m2 launched to the right with velocity v. And here are your x and y coordinates. And then over on the far right, similarly, got a box. Here's the Earth. And gravity, uh, gravitational acceleration g pointing downward. Coordinates x and y on the box. So in this middle case, the box is resting on the ground. In the right case, it is falling toward the ground. And here you've got same experiment, mass m1 and mass m2 launched with velocity v. Now the question is, what happens in these three cases? Let's go over here, the first box. What happens to mass m1? It stays put. If it's initially at x is equal to x0, it stays at x is equal to x0, and y is equal to y0. y0. It doesn't uh, move. It has no initial velocity. So the law of inertia says it just stays put. How about mass m2? Well, again, the law of inertia says if it's moving with a constant velocity, it continues to. So if x starts at x0 and it's got a velocity in the positive x direction of v, then x is x0 plus vt. It has no velocity in the y direction, so y just remains whatever its initial value of y0 is. Now so that's in the floating frame. Now let's go over here to the frame where the box is on the surface of the Earth. What happens there? What happens to m1? Well, it falls, accelerates downward. So that if x is equal to x0, there's no acceleration in the x direction, so that remains constant. But y is equal to y0, and then it falls minus 1 half gt squared. How about mass 2? What happens to that? Uh, you're launching it toward the right, but then it starts to fall in the y direction. It maintains the same velocity in the x direction, and it follows a parabola. So in that case, x is equal to x0 plus vt, just like in the floating case. But y, just like the mass released from rest, gets a minus one-half gt squared added to it. Now that is the case where it's sitting on the surface of the Earth. Now what about this case, where the box is above the Earth, but it's allowed to fall at the same time that the masses are let go? What happens there? Well, let's see. Mass m1 is falling, but so does the box. So they both have their y values uh, relative to the Earth would both have a minus one-half gt squared. But since they both fall together, relative to the box, um, m1 stays in the same place. x is equal to x0, y is equal to y0. Okay, so mass two, what happens with it? Well, x is equal to x0 plus vt because it's launched toward the right. y would be y0. If it was sitting on the ground, it would be y0 minus 1 half gt squared. But the box is falling also. So relative to the box, they have the same acceleration. So it just looks like y is equal to y0. So notice what happens in this case. These two situations give you identical results for the experiments.
And this, although seemingly simple, is a very profound insight. In fact, Einstein said realizing this was the happiest thought in his life. Now, what was so profound about this insight? Well, for Einstein, who had the physical intuition to understand the significance, it led him to formulate what we could call the equivalence principle, which we'll state as no experiment can distinguish floating from falling. So let's look at a schematic representation of two experiments. Imagine we have a box and inside that box over on the left side we launch a pulse of light that travels to the right with speed c, the speed of light. And so at equal intervals of time, it will move equal distances from the left to the right side of the box. Okay. I'll follow that path. Now, so we'll call this, uh, this is the floating experiment. Now we'll do a falling experiment. So, and don't take this too seriously the way I'm drawing this. This is just to kind of illustrate the concepts. Now we'll have this box. And again, we'll launch a light pulse from the left side toward the right, at the speed of light. And now this is going to be the falling experiment. And the behavior of the light relative to the box must be the same as in the floating experiment. Otherwise, we would be able to distinguish floating from falling. But what happens as this falls? And this is falling in a gravitational field, G, pointing downwards. Well, the box starts to fall. And uh, so later on, Again, uh, I'm going to offset these to the right, kind of to represent the passage of time. Of course, it would fall directly down. What happens? Well, at the next interval of time, let's take that to be the one here in the middle. See, it'll be at this point, relative to the box, just like it was in the floating case. And then we go on to a later time. And uh, maybe that's here. And now the pulse has reached the right side of the box. But since the y coordinate, the, the vertical coordinate of the box, is a decreasing quadratically in time, that has to be true also of the light pulse. So we can kind of imagine that the light is following a quadratic, a par parabolic curve down toward the Earth. Now, this, of course, grossly exaggerates that. It would be extremely small amount of, of, uh, of falling in the vertical direction because it's traveling at the speed of light. But this is the basic concept. And what is the significance of that? Einstein realized it means that light falls, quote unquote, in a gravitational field. And it was this insight that allowed Einstein to take previous stuff we've been talking about, which is the theory of special relativity, 
theory that applies only to inertial reference frames, and then generalize that to what's called the general theory of relativity. which can be applied in gravitational fields and, and indeed in any physical situation. And it was in, I believe, 1919, uh, during an eclipse of the sun, that astronomers were able to observe the apparent change in position of stars whose light grazed by the sun, and they could see the stars because the sun was eclipsed, uh, relative to where they would be in the sky if the sun was not near there, and they verified this bending of light rays, and that made Einstein an international hero. Here is a rather dramatic demonstration of the ability of a massive object to bend light rays. Looking at this sketch here, imagine there is a very distant object, and this is your eye, and in between your eye and the object is an extremely massive object, like maybe a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies, then light leaving this object could be bent such that even though it would have, without this object present, gone off in this direction, it bends and then arrives at your eye. And light going down in this direction would have gone off down here, but because of the bending of the light ray by the gravitational field of this massive object comes over and comes into your eye here. And this would be true at all angles um, on the sky going around 360 degrees what would you see instead of seeing this dot this object you would see it spread out into a ring and here's an example of that from the hubble space telescope here's this massive object and here is an object behind that massive object which has been bent into a ring this is all the light from one object that would have just looked like a small thing on the sky but was bent out into this what's called an Einstein ring in honor of Einstein. So yes, this does happen. Gravitational fields bend light rays. Now let's look at, here's a z-axis, like an optical axis, and an x-axis. And imagine we launch a ray of light parallel to the z-axis, but it's in a gravitational field, so it begins to bend downward. Well, all right, so let's say it starts off traveling along the z direction with the speed c over n. n is the index of refraction of the material. It starts out going flat relative parallel to the z-axis, but it ends up and of course I'm greatly exaggerating all the angles here, traveling at an angle. And we can figure that angle out from this triangle. This will be the velocity in the z direction, which will remain c over n. And this is the velocity downward due to the acceleration of gravity, which will be g times dt, if dt is the interval of time. And this will result in a bending by an angle d theta. Okay, so this is just the idea. This this is the constant velocity, and of course this would this would be the speed of light, and this would just be a, a very small velocity. So this angle would be incredibly small, but I'm grossly exaggerating it here. So from this we can write d theta is equal to, and we'll take this to be a negative angle or going downward, minus this over that in the small angle approximation. So that would be g dt over c over n, which of course is minus g n over c dt. And now coming back up here, it's moving along the z-axis with a constant velocity c over n. That means that it moves a distance dz is equal to c over n in a time dt. Therefore, we can write that this is equal to minus g, and for dt, we'll substitute n over c dz, so that's two factors of n over z, so that's 
n over c squared dz. Well, now this is a differential equation. We've got d theta equals something dz divided by dz to get d theta dz is equal to minus g n over c squared. Now, if you go back to lecture three, where we talk about the propagation of rays in inhomogeneous media, if we have a medium where the index of refraction is a function of x, the differential equation is d theta dz is equal to 1 over n dn dx. Now, this would be the end of it if uh, g was a constant, but we're going to be interested in what happens if this is occurring near a spherical object. And in this case, we'll take x to be the distance from its center. And therefore, we know in this case that the acceleration due to gravity will be a function of distance from the center. According to Newton's law, g is equal to the gravitational constant, big G, times big M, the mass of the object, over the square of the distance from the center. That's Newton's law of gravitation. So going down here, we've got 1 over n, the n dx, is equal to, on the other side, minus little g, but that's going to be minus big G, m over x squared, n squared over c squared. Now let's move all of the n terms over to the left, divide by n squared. Here we're going to get 1 over n cubed, and we'll have dn over n cubed. Multiply through by dx to put that over on the other side. We've got a constant out in front, which is minus big G m over c squared. And then that leaves dx over x squared. Now, we want to integrate both sides of that equation. The integral dn over n cubed is minus 1 over 2n squared. The integral of dx over x squared is minus 1 over x, and minus minus is plus, so that becomes plus g m over c squared, 1 over x, and of course we have constants of integration, and so I'll write that as a minus k, some constant of integration. Now we can solve this for n and just do the algebra there. What you find is then that n is equal to the square root of 2k minus 2 big G m over c squared 1 over x. That is n index of refraction as a function of x. That would mean that would be the equivalent index of refraction that would give you the same path of this ray as it has when it's falling in a gravitational field. So we've got n is equal to 1 over the square root of 2k minus 2gm over c squared, 1 over x. And let's require that n goes to 1, the value for empty space, as x goes to infinity. We get infinitely far away from the gravitating body, the gravitational field goes to 0. Um, and if you require that, well, this, this term goes away, and so 2k must be equal to 1, and so this must be equal then to 1 over square root of 1 minus 2gm over c squared, 1 over x. Now notice, 
this thing, there's a value of x where this becomes 0. 1 over 0 goes to infinity. n goes to infinity as 2gm over c squared 1 over x goes to 1. And that would be the case where x goes to 2gm over c squared. We call that distance, r sub s, is 2gm over c squared is the radius of the event horizon of a black hole. Because at that radius, according to our calculation, the index of refraction would go to infinity and the light would freeze. It would stop moving. Now, this is uh, what we just did is not a rigorous general relativity derivation. That's a little more involved, but you do end up, we did end up by basically luck coming up with the actual rigorous value for what's called the Schwarzschild radius, the radius of the event horizon of a black hole. So, what, are, what kind of radii are we talking about? So, if you took Earth's mass, um, that radius would be. 8.87 millimeters. You'd have to compress the Earth down into a ball less than uh, one centimeter in radius, and then it would form a black hole. For the Sun, you put in the solar mass, you get a radius of 2.95 kilometers. Okay, so these are objects which are unbelievably dense. In fact, according to general theory of relativity, they collapse to an infinite density at a singularity right at their center. So these are some of the very interesting uh, physical phenomena that come about between the interplay of optics and the theory of relativity.